and welcome <laughs> to this week's Artist on Art. I have the great pleasure of speaking with Kate Compton. Kate, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi, uh, it's lovely to be here. It's really, really fun for me. Uh, Kate is both a gamer and an artist. And so, you know, two of my big passions. <laughs> if I had a, I do have Gamers on Game radio show, she would be on both. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you in here. Kate does uh, some, um, well, you, you, you come to UCSC from the game world. You worked at EA? Yep, I work, used to work at EA at Maxis on um, games such as Spore and the latest SimCity. Two giant games. <laughs> Kate, tell us, how did you get into it? Gosh, how did I get into it? Um, so a lot of people have the stories of how they got into the game industry, and um, pretty much all of them start with kind of the same things of, oh, I spent my childhood playing Super Mario Brothers. Oh, I, I played all this Dungeons and & Dragons, and I actually didn't play that many games as a kid. Um, I played a lot of adventure games, so Monkey Island and that stuff, but uh, the thing that most brought me into games was actually making dollhouses. Um, I used to make tons of dollhouses and terrariums and dioramas. Um, dollhouses? Yeah. Dollhouses was your vehicle to games. Can you elaborate <laughs> a little bit? How are dollhouses? Well, you're playing a game, especially SimCity, huh? <laughs> right. I, I think SimCity pre showed pretty obviously that um, a lot of people like building their little world and having control over it. Um, and yeah, I just loved making little worlds, uh, sort of outfitting them with all the stuff, making sure everything was polished and you know, adding all the accessories to make things, to make a full little world. And yeah, that's, um, that well, ends up being what I, the sort of games that I make. Yeah. And it's funny that we're saying games because I think even Will Wright would question if SimCity <laughs> is a, uh, in fact, I think he did ask that question when he spoke mm -hmm. here a couple of weeks ago, Will Wright was here, the inventor of SimCity yeah. and, and, uh, Spore, um, yep. And he he himself, I mean, the, you know, the definition of, of what a game is is very long because <laughs> you've got to throw in everything, right, in the kitchen right. sink. you've got challenge and you've got difficulty. And one of the things is keeping score. Mm -hmm. And so how do you keep score in right. SimCity? Yeah, and, and especially in something like The Sims. SimCity, at least, well, I guess both of them you have the money issue, so you can kind of keep score by money. But, yeah, you always, I don't know, there's there's... Um, using the score to like the little number that goes up to make people feel like they're moving forward, but then people will always come up with other other ways to keep score. Right, like my house is hella better than your house, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah, or I was trying to hook up these two characters, and I keep score as to whether or not that how you know how well that's working. Like, right, whatever right. my strange little desires are that are being affected in The Sims. So tell me, Kate, do you, what do you think? Do you think it's a game? Um. Honestly, I'm just not that interested in the definition of game. There you go. Why <laughs> but, even ask the question? Well, yeah, it, it's also a personal preference. So a lot of people are very driven by competitiveness, by the sort of difficulty curve in games, and that's very important to them. And, you know, a lot of the indie game designers are very into, make, like, Mario was too easy for them, so they were driven into the indie games industry to make the game that even they couldn't defeat. And so we get a lot of indie games that are just fiendishly difficult, like Super Meat Boy is kind of a legendary example of that. And I don't like difficulty. <laughs> I know this is odd for a game person to say, but I don't really like difficulty, and I like my challenges to be very sort of interspersed with lots of just kind of hanging around, wandering around, lots of exploring. Like, I, I play games to explore. So your challenge is, is really found in the process yeah of, yeah, of going through. I like poking at interesting systems. Poking at interesting systems. And you are in the I... Uh, oh. EIS <laughs> studio, the Expressive Intelligence Studio here yeah. at UCSC and the PhD program, the computer science program that mm -hmm. um, we will have. Uh, there's two graduating PhD students this year. Yeah. Uh, Chris Lewis is actually going to be giving his defense at the top of the hour at two o'clock. <laughs> Chris was on Chris. <laughs> we had all the power to you, baby. And he was on a couple of weeks talking about his, his, um, dissertation and the projects that he's been working on. And then up next after this show will be Mike Trainer. And I don't know if you have time, mm -hmm. if you can hang out with us, that would be great. Yeah, I think so. I want to catch Chris's dissertation. But oh, yeah, that's right. He then. invited everybody. So. 
<laughs> I'm not sure if that, that was meant to be, but <laughs> it would be funny if a whole bunch of people showed up at yes, Chris's. Everybody uh, on the radio, be sure to attend <laughs> Chris, Chris's defense for his PhD. Nothing much on the line there. Um, but um, Mike Trainers also was in the Expressive Intelligence yeah, yeah. Studio, or is about yeah. to complete that. And um, one of your primary projects in the Expressive Intelligence Studios of a game called Chekhov. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something you um, collaborated with Chris Lewis as yeah, well. Yeah, it's uh, Jim Whitehead is the lead on that project. Um, Chris Lewis is one of the programmers as well as John Murray. Um, and yeah, it's it's an interesting project. Uh, do you want me to talk a little bit about it or introduce it? Or of what course. Would you like to know? <laughs> and this is well, I want to just ask you. This is your primary project. Yeah, yeah. This is the one that's funding me. Um, so. I funding you to get through to get my, through my PhD, which is a five-year, six-year process. Yeah, five-year. I think I'm aiming at I'm five years, rush. and you're in your second year. Yep. And so you're about to complete your second year, mm-hmm. and then in the fall start your third year, and hopefully this will be the project that takes you out. Um, the, well, yeah, that, that funds me until I'm able to maybe find some of my own funding. It depends it, the graduate program. It depends on how you do it, but. Um, it's it's often really cool if you can somehow figure out how to get funded for doing your own particular um, passion of research. Right, which is the other aspect of getting your PhD yeah. is not only do you work on a project and yeah. a collaborative project at that, but you're also writing your own dissertation on the the aspects of games that are your passions. Yeah, yeah. And you are coming from a very interesting place, not only with the dollhouses, mm-hmm. but you're a lifelong crafter. Yeah. And so you're, tell us about <laughs> how your passion is coming in through the game's uh, yeah. discipline. Um, so yeah, it's been very interesting to be myself um, in, in both the games industry and then I also hang out in the Silicon Valley um, application development community a lot, like with all the hackers and the hacker scene, um, because I'm both a very strong feminist, um, I'm a lifelong crafter, and so I, 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 as a feminist, I'm kind of watching for these things of, you know, oh my gosh, here are all these people, um, a lot of the people in games who are so driven off of the things that they loved as children, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, Mario, that sort of thing, um, or, you know, whatever drives the app dev guys, yeah, the app development guys. Um, and gosh, like, you know, I, I've got a couple of female friends and I who are also crafters, actually a, a couple of the women in the ICE lab, um, April Grow, um, and Ann Sullivan and Jillian Smith, who are all devoted crafters as well. And so we're just we're kind of egging each other on now because we all love craft so much and we also love programming of, you know, how, how can programming help us do our craft projects or how, even better, how can our, you know, if we've done crafts for so long, we've learned something about crafting and aesthetics. Um, how does that aesthetic knowledge like filter back into actual code? <laughs> I find this fascinating. So you're you're looking at where crafting and computing, digital computing, right? Where they come together, mm-hmm. that that place of overlap. And I have to share my experience of meeting with you. Uh, I had the great pleasure of meeting you a couple of years ago at the Future of Games oh, yeah. uh, symposium down in San Jose. That was uh, the first one, right? The first one, right? And you came with these uh, glasses, these virtual... Oh, no, that was the second time. Was was it the first time? I think it was the first time. Ah, yeah. Because not only did you have these virtual, uh, these, like glasses that could help oh, yes, you. my augmented reality display device. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, looked like, um, kind of like these, uh, like Jules Verne, if he was going to make three-dimensional glasses that had like plates um, stacked on a, <laughs> on tracking that you would put your eyes up against. I, I'm not describing this very well. Can you tell us about <laughs> Gosh. that? Yeah, this is, this is my augmented reality device I've been working on for a while. And like, we just started a company for last year. Um, but yeah, I, I love the laser cutter. I don't know how many people out there in Radio Land are familiar with laser cutters. This but... is Kate Compton. <laughs> She's telling us all about her passions. Yeah, no. Well, so so the laser cutter is the superpower for people who do crafts. Um, um, and I have to say that you also gave me a business card that I kept for years until I moved my office, actually. Um, and it was a laser cut, beautiful business card and it, of lace. 
and yeah. just a beautiful card, but also fragile. And I wish and I'd given you one of the silk handkerchiefs that I made too. Oh yes, you you were out of the the yeah. business. Yes. Anyways, so Kate has been really truly playing with uh, mm -hmm. these laser cutters. Yeah, um, it allows you to do all the because it's um, basically a robot that's controlling essentially a tiny lightsaber that's cutting through your material with just sort of perfect precision and not with a whisper of air to even push your silk or, or paper around. You can do these incredibly intricate designs, you know, the sort of thing that if you look at like, you know, Swiss clockmakers from the 1600s, the sort of things that, you know, if somebody were carving something for five winters in a row, every night, all night, and they would get these ornate designs. And, you know, I, I can just punch this into the computer now and this you know, little fairy hand moves this, moves this tip of fire and cuts out my designs with, with perfect precision. So I can, you know, I can do text, I can do lace work on the edges, and you know, I just get, I, I love Baroque, Renaissance, ornate, like extremely ornate stuff, and so this allows me to make all that. And I have no patience, so this allows me to make the stuff that I would never ever have patience to make. So Kate Compton, how would you, um, someone who has never seen a laser cutter, but let's say has been a craftsperson mm -hmm. for many years, um, describe a little bit of the process in which you made one of these um, pieces. Sure. Um, my process is a little different than many craftspeople might, because I'm, I'm so computer bound, um, that um, I use Adobe Illustrator for a lot of it. Um, they have... Well, gosh, it's really hard to just sort of describe this without a lot of hand gestures. Um, well, but you're on video. Oh, that's so true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, for example, I have these uh, these hearts that I did for Valentine's Day. I do uh, laser cut paper hearts to give out away as Valentine's, and I sold them on Etsy last year. So I just draw the outline of a heart, and there's this concept in computer graphics of vectors. Um, which means it's just uh, sort of the mathematical description of a line. So it, un, instead of being like little square pixels, it's actually, it knows the perfect curve. So then um, Illustrator has this neat thing called brushes where I can make sort of a pattern. So um, one of the, the patterns that I really liked was DNA. So I have these sort of short segment of DNA uh, crisscrossing itself, um, but all done in like sort of cutout pattern. Um, so then I can say, okay, now repeat that interlacing strand of DNA all the way around the heart. And so, you know, I only had to draw that one little short segment and then it makes it curve perfectly matching the curve of it all the way along. So I did, you know, I did that. I did um, uh, a chain of allosaurus skulls. I did a chain of velociraptors chasing each other around ah! the hearts. And, you know, as, long, as soon as you got that pattern, so that's kind of what computers are really good at is once I've got one pattern and I do it once, then I just have to change the graphic that I'm that I'm putting around the edge of the heart. So if I wanted to do, you know, words around the edge of a heart or, you know, extra hearts around the edge of a heart or birds around the edge of a heart, I can do all that just in the same way. And then with the laser cutter, depending on, of course, the type of laser mm -hmm. cutter you have, you can use different varying thicknesses of material yeah. in which to have this cutout. Um, yeah. As you were saying, the, yes, the silk, leather, laser, and <laughs> stuff. The, you're doing some great na um, characterizing through games, I think, with the, the hand of light, the lightsaber that is um, <laughs> uh, burning through this material, mm -hmm. but in such a precise way that yeah. you can get the tiniest of, of holes. And again, yeah. depending on the how thick the material mm -hmm. is. So, you, so there is materiality that you're you're challenged with. Yeah, and it's actually it's got really neat kind of pushback because as the laser burns it it leaves a little trail of smoke along one side where the wind is blowing so you actually get like a little bit of shading that happens naturally. You get a little bit of a shading and um yeah, it's, it, it, there's a lot of play that mm -hmm. you get to do with it. Um yeah. but they they do come with some really great disc just neat, um Handbooks, the the laser cutters that I've seen, oh, really? that um, will let you know, you know, what thicknesses uh, right. um, to, because you have to calibrate the that wand yeah. of fire to. And if you've just got one really nice piece of leather, you don't want to have, you know, try it once and try it again. Right. The laser cutters have broken my heart on a number of occasions. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You can always try again. <laughs> and so you're. Um, you're going through not only with laser cutting, but you're also playing with 3D printing. Yeah, 3D printing as well. Which is a different thing because you're mm -hmm. not taking away from material. Yeah, you're, you're, it's you're, additive process instead. 
additive process, folks. So mm-hmm. if someone's never seen a 3D printer, what what would you tell them? Sure. Um, gosh. Uh, you, have you ever made those drip castles on the beach um, where you pick up a handful of wet sand and you kind of drip it on top? Actually, that's it. It's maybe a terrible description. I'm trying to think of... <laughs> but that is additive. Maybe, you're yeah, adding material yeah. in the you know, dripping just, kind of way. You're just laying down one layer after another. Um, so it goes through almost like an inkjet printer laying down ink, but imagine that the ink is thick instead. So each time it goes over the page, it's laying down another layer of ink and another layer of ink and another layer of ink. And so you can, in uh, practice, create... Uh, yeah, sculptural can... things that can't even be made with yeah. your hands because you can actually get inside. Oh yeah, of people have made beautiful things of like um, I, I I've seen some of the like antique carved eggs where, or carved wooden balls where there's like a ball inside of another ball inside of another ball. Um, they're all sort of nested nestled together, carved out of a single piece, and that was like the the big woodworker skill piece of the day. And now because the 3D printer is just doing it in layers, it can trap objects inside of other objects. That's right. And actually create ball bearings and yeah. movable pieces that, um, mm-hmm. I, I guess the aeronautical, uh, uh, the aeronautical, um, uh, Companies have been using this for years for creating fans that were yep. um, actually one of somebody that I'm uh, doing a little bit of consulting work with. Um, he's using it to do jet engines. Yeah, the aerospace industry has been mm-hmm. uh, using 3D, and they're using titanium as a as yeah. their like sand goo that's yep. <laughs> dripping. Yeah, I don't have it with me today, but I've got a little uh, sintered steel. Um, gold-plated necklace, so it's actually steel that's been 3D printed. So oh. It's incredibly, like, it's really chunky and satisfying. It, it's kind of like this style of metal. Um, and but, she's pointing to her necklace that has these beautiful triangles um, Yeah, these aren't 3D printed. A, this is just from the mall. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but they're hanging on a necklace. Yeah. Um, but you, you can create anything with mm-hmm. the, this yeah. technology. And so we have a 3D printer here on campus? Um, I think Danum is putting one together. That's the Digital Arts and New Media program. Um, but, oh, there's also one downtown. I know Makerspace has a number of 3D printers, and then you can actually go online through Shapeways. Is it Makerspace or Maker's Factory? Oh, make, sorry. Maker, Maker fact? Makers. Mm, uh, the one downtown. Gosh, I'm forgetting. It's over in the Cruzio yeah. building. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there's, there's only one 3D printer center downtown. I'm sure somebody can direct you to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, so one of the really neat things about 3D printing is, like, kind of go back to earlier when I, when I said it's just like a regular printer. So, Think to yourself. So it, it's going to change the way that we look at a lot of stuff because um, if uh, think of like when you print on a normal sheet of paper, what is that printer happier doing? Is it happier printing out you know a page of ornate Shakespearean script, or is it happier printing a large black rectangle? If anybody has replaced a printer cartridge, you know that it really doesn't like printing out the large black, black rectangle. It's it's happier printing out the page of Shakespeare than it is printing out that page. Well, now imagine that in two dimensions. Instead of, you know, sort of everything in a studio, as I'm looking around, it's like um, very rectangular. You have to kind of, when you make more ornate stuff, you have to put more effort and more money into making ornate stuff. Um, For the 3D printer, it's the exact opposite. Like the 3D printer, it's actually kind of expensive to make a solid, like, brick. Um, But if you made that brick instead with, you know, the sculptural scenes of ancient Greece with all these cutouts and filigrees and stuff, it's actually cheaper to do that because it's using less material. Oh my god, I just got like a vision of like the Parthenon's mantle with all of the sculptures and the horses that you, yeah. you could create your bricks um, with that inside. Yeah, it, it makes the defaults um, like extravagant, beautiful stuff, which actually kind of brings me to my research um, is... So we've got these amazing tools like the 3D printer, the laser cutter now that give us these superpowers. So we can we can print out anything we can design. Um, but then that brings us to the question of, well, how do I design things? You know, we, we have this kind of society where it's like, oh, well, maybe I'm, I've studied design. I'm professional at this. I know all these really arcane tools. Well, I'll be, de- I'll be the designer. But, you know, why can't you be the designer? You know what you like. You know, I, I can I can make the necklace that maybe I think a hundred people will like, but only you know the necklace that only you wouldn't like. So um, how do we how do we give people the ability to make these? You know, if if it's just as cheap for you to make you know a pair of wedge heels that has you know the scenes of the Parthenon holding up the heel, um, and maybe you want that. Like how do you how do you say what you actually want under that heel? Because our our design tools right now are are made for doing big solid bricks of things. That's so, right. 
That's how do I make tools that make people feel creative? And like, like you know, I just wave my hand and the sort of magic wand of the computer says, oh, yeah, I think what you what you really mean is this floral stuff and that floral stuff and these figurines and those. And yeah, it's it's a really interesting space to be in. It's really exciting. Just talk to us a little bit, Kate Compton, mm -hmm. about Chekhov. Oh, about Chekhov. Yeah. So the, again, that's the research project I'm on. Um, it's um, in the PhD program in the PhD in program the in ICE. Expressive Intelligence in Expressive Studio. Expressive Intelligence Studio. Um, the yeah. catch-all. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the idea behind that is that um, DARPA really. Uh, so um, there's a, a branch or some sub branch of the United States government is called DARPA, which is the Defense Something Something Research, research Something Something. Um, anyway, they fund kind of the out there research. Um, They've been a lot of a lot of innovative things have come out of DARPA. Yeah, a lot of the, actually a lot of the self driving car stuff came out of them. And and games actually a yeah. lot of games. Yeah, the so person for no, they tend to fund the sort of stuff that becomes important only after like several years. Um, so what they're funding right now is they really want a way for people to be able to put in a piece of software. And for that piece, so feed software into some sort of machine, and that machine says, oh, yes, that software is bug-free, which um, it's it's hard to say how important that is if you're not a computer scientist. But um, we Well, we like, can explain it to sure. our dear audience. So <laughs> you there when you're writing program, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the, there's a lot of room. There's a lot of different ways that there could be a bug that... Yeah brings itself out only through use. You only yeah. find out about it after somebody has been testing it. Yeah, and no matter how smart you are, if you're the greatest computer scientist in the world, your programs have bugs, and you know that they have bugs, but you don't know where they are. Not my trainers. <laughs> <laughs> my, my trainer has the, never my, written a bug our, in his life. <laughs> our, ne our next guest is here in the KZSC, Mike yeah. Trainer, and um, being a programmer, he's... Uh, yeah. Yes, but anyways, but, most oh, people do have bugs, yeah. and that could be a really big problem mm -hmm. for rolling out because you want to give it to the public or have it used. Yeah, or make sure that it's safe, um, that it's not going to, you know, if your Mars rover is on Mars, you really don't want your pathfinding bug to have a hiccup just in that one situation. Right. Um, and so DARPA wants to figure out a way that to, programmers can test their mm -hmm. programs through running it through this. Yeah, so that's kind of like the giant umbrella idea of it. Um, and they're, they're funding lots of different projects to try and solve it in lots of clever ways. Um, ours, um, I'm going to kind of wave my hands a little bit here, but ours, um, the idea is that it takes that program that somebody wants to say things about. Like, I, I want to say about this program that when this particular loop runs, this thing is always true. Um, turns that into... Co uh, turns that into... And well, okay, so we've got this iPad game that looks like um, you've got flowers, like you've got sort of a an interesting sort of floral arrangement on the screen. Um, you know, it's sort of a bizarre looking flower, but it's, it's very pretty. I did the art. Um, it, very pretty, if I may say so. <laughs> you know, when you do the art. I bet it's beautiful. <laughs> um, so it, and then you you play as a researcher trying to say things about this plant. So you're sort of a um, a botanist who is on a um, I believe our plot right now is you're a botanist who's on sort of some sort of undiscovered island and you're trying to say you're trying to send information back to headquarters about these plants. And each of these plants is actually generated by um, some sort of, sort of magically generated from the code that they're trying to test. And as you're saying things about these plants, that, oh, yes, um, as a botanist, I can say that uh, as this plant grows, um, the number of blue flowers is always twice the number of red flowers. And the number of green flowers is never greater than the number of red flowers. And, you know, you you input this stuff, um, and the head, bo the head botanist in the game gives you a little star. And that that information actually goes back and um, hopefully eventually goes back to the original makers of that code and they say, oh, I didn't realize that when, when my loop runs, it's always going to have, you know, X is always going to be like less than or greater than Y. I see. Um, and hopefully they'll, that, that will give them some useful information. So you're inviting users to explore right. your landscape in which then will inform the programmers that, yep. that these are what these people are finding and how to write that yeah. out or in or so people are actually helping make you know more secure code it's this kind of citizen science movement that's citizen science um what is it not crowdfunding uh crowdsourcing yeah yeah citizen funding crowdsourcing yeah um so kind of the same idea uh as i believe it's is it fold at home no fold it 
um, Folded is this game that uh, was incredibly successful for um, uh, proteins can fold up in different ways. They're like kind of a long string of molecules, and they can crunch together in different ways. And how they crunch together can actually make big differences and, you know, can inform how how medicines are made or how we understand how these proteins are going to behave. And computers are really lousy at trying to figure out how, you know, if it sees some sort of complex molecule figuring out that this little bit and this little bit really, oh, it just looks like those two will just snap together. Computers are really bad at that, but humans are really good at it. So they made a game where people fold up these proteins um, and then get rewarded for it. And it's been this huge success story. And because, and you know, they, I think they won some sort of big science award. And like the science award was actually given out to like the makers of this game and all their users. <laughs> Who are also, the users are the participants in the... Yeah, the users are the players of the game. They're explorers. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Yeah, Kate, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kate Compton, it's coming to the end of our show. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really wonderful talking with you. I hope you can come back on, especially when it's time for you to get your PhD. Absolutely. Such as our other guest, Mike Trainer, um, who is uh, post defense. And uh, <laughs> but let's take a let's take a quick little uh, break. You're listening to Artist on Art and. Uh, Stay tuned so we can talk with Mike Trainer and uh, we're going to listen to the Cesaria Evora. 